Hello guys and welcome back to my channel. In this video, we will be learning about the knee joint. This is the anterior view of the right knee joint. The knee joint is the largest and most complex joint of the body. The complexity is a result of the fusion of three joints in one. It is formed by the fusion of the lateral femorotibial joint, the medial femorotibial joint and the femoropetalar joints. This is the lateral femorotibial joint and this is the medial femorotibial joint. This is the lateral view of the knee joint where we can see the femoropetalar joint. The knee joint is a condylar synovial joint. It has two condylar joints between the condyles of the femur and the condyles of the tibia and one saddle joint between the femur and the patella. It is also called a complex joint as the cavity is divided by the menisci. Now looking at the articular surfaces, the knee joint is formed by the condyles of the femur, the condyles of the tibia and the patella. These are the condyles of the femur and these are the condyles of the tibia. Now looking at the main points in the introduction of the knee joint, the knee joint is the largest and most complex joint of the body. The complexity is a result of the fusion of three joints in one. It is formed by the fusion of the lateral femorotibial, medial femorotibial and the femoropetalar joints. It is a condylar synovial joint. It has two condylar joints between the condyles of the femur and tibia, one saddle joint between the femur and the patella. It is also a complex joint as the cavity is divided by the menisci. Now looking at the articular surfaces, the knee joint is formed by the condyles of the femur, the patella and the condyles of the tibia. Now let's look at the ligaments of the knee joint. There are nine ligaments. The first is a fibrous capsule, the ligamentum patellae, the tibial collateral or medial collateral ligament, the fibula collateral or lateral ligament, the oblique popliteal ligament, the arcuate popliteal ligament, the cruciate ligament, menisci or semilunar cat cartilages and the transverse ligament. Now let's look at the fibrous capsule in detail. Right here you can see the joint capsule which is a fibrous or articular capsule. The fibrous capsule is very thin and is deficient anteriorly where it is replaced by the quadriceps femoris, the patella as you can see here and the ligamentum patellae. Looking at the femoral attachment of the fibrous capsule, it is attached about half to one centimeter beyond the articular margin. The attachment has three special features. First, anteriorly the attachment of the fibrous capsule is deficient. Posteriorly, it is attached to the intercondylar line and third, laterally it encloses the origin of the popliteus muscle. This right here is the tendon of the popliteus. So the fibrous capsule encloses the origin of the popliteus muscle laterally. Moving on to the tibial attachment of the fibrous capsule, it is attached about half to one centimeter beyond the articular margin. The attachment also has three special features. Firstly, anteriorly, it descends along the margins of the condyles to the tibial tuberosity where it is deficient. Second, posteriorly, it is attached to the intercondylar ridge. And third, posterolaterally, there is a gap beyond the lateral condyle for the passage of the tendon of the popliteus as I had mentioned earlier. There is a gap posterolaterally for the passage of the tendon of the popliteus right here. Now looking at the important points under the fibrous capsule, the fibrous capsule is very thin and is deficient anteriorly where it is replaced by the quadriceps femoris, the patella and the ligamentum patellae. The femoral attachment, it is attached about half to one centimeter beyond the articular margins. The attachment has three special features, anteriorly it is deficient. Posteriorly, it is attached to the intercondylar line and laterally it encloses the origin of the popliteus. Looking at the tibial attachment, it is attached about half to one centimeter beyond the articular margins. The attachment has three special features. Anteriorly, it descends along the margin of the condyles 
to the tibial tuberosity where it is deficient. Posteriorly, it is attached to the intercondylar ridge and posterolaterally, there is a gap behind the lateral condyle for the passage of the tendon of the popliteus muscle. Moving on to the ligamentum petalae, this is a ligamentum petalae also called the petalar ligament. This is the central portion of the common tendon of insertion of the quadriceps femoris. The ligamentum petalae is about 7.5 cm long and 2.5 cm broad. It is attached above to the margins and rough posterior surface of the apex of the petala and below to the smooth upper part of the tibial tuberosity. The ligamentum petalae is related to the superficial and deep infrapetala bursa as you can see right here the infrapetala bursa and to the infrapetala pad of fat as you can see right here. Now concising the points under the ligamentum petalae this is the central portion of the common tendon of insertion of the quadriceps femoris. The ligamentum petalae is about 7.5 cm long and 2.5 cm broad. It is attached above to the margins and the rough posterior surface of the apex of the petala and below to the smooth upper part of the tibial tuberosity. The ligamentum petalae is related to the superficial and deep infrapetala bursae and to the infrapetala pad of fat. Now looking at the tibial collateral ligament in detail, as you can see here, the tibial collateral ligament. This is a long band of great strength. Superiorly, it is attached to the medial epicondyle of the femur, just below the adductor tubercle. Inferiorly, it divides into anterior and posterior parts. The anterior or the superficial part is about 10 cm long and 1.25 cm broad and is separated from the capsule by one or two bursae. Now the posterior or the deep part is short and blends with the capsule and with the medial meniscus as you can see right here. Now concising the points under the tibial collateral ligament or the medial ligament, this is a long band of great strength. Superiorly, it is attached to the medial epicondyle of the femur just below the adductor tubercle. Inferiorly, it divides into anterior and posterior parts. The anterior or superficial part is about 10 cm long and 1.25 cm broad and is separated from the capsule by one or two bursae. The posterior or the deep part of the ligament is short and blends with the capsule and with the medial meniscus. Moving on to the fibular collateral ligament as you can see here. This ligament is strong and cord like. It is about 5 cm long. Superiorly, it is attached to the lateral epicondyle of the femur just above the popliteal groove. Inferiorly, it is embraced by the tendon of the biceps femoris and is attached to the head of the fibula in front of its apex. It is separated from the lateral meniscus as you can see right here by the tendon of the popliteus. It is free from the capsule. Now concising the points under the fibula collateral or lateral ligament, this ligament is strong and cord like. It is about 5 cm long. Superiorly, it is attached to the lateral epicondyle of the femur just above the popliteal groove. Inferiorly, it is embraced by the tendon of the biceps femoris and is attached to the head of the fibula in front of its apex. It is separated from the lateral meniscus by the tendon of the popliteus and it is free from the capsule. Now let's move on to the oblique popliteal ligament. This is the posterior view of the knee joint. And this is the oblique popliteal ligament. Now, the oblique popliteal ligament is an expansion from the tendon of the semimembranosus, as you can see right here. It runs upwards and laterally, blends with the posterior surface of the capsule and is attached to the intercondylar line and the lateral condyle of the femur, as you can see right here. Moving on to the arcuate popliteal ligament, this is a posterior expansion from the short lateral ligament. It extends backwards from the head of the fibula right here, arches over the tendon of the popliteus right here and is attached to the posterior border of the intercondylar area of the tibia. Concising the important points under the oblique popliteal ligament and the arcuate popliteal ligament, the oblique popliteal ligament is an expansion from the tendon of the semimembranosus muscle. It runs upwards and laterally, blends with the posterior surface of the capsule 
and is attached to the intercondylar line and the lateral condyle of the femur. The arcuate popliteal ligament. It is a posterior expansion from the short lateral ligament. It extends backwards from the head of the fibula, arches over the tendon of the popliteus and is attached to the posterior border of the intercondylar area of the tibia. Nextly, let's look at the cruciate ligaments of the knee joint. This is the anterior view of the right knee joint. This is the lateral aspect and this is the medial aspect of the knee joint. Now, the cruciate ligaments as you can see right here are very thick and strong fibrous bands. They act as direct bonds of union between the tibia and the femur to maintain anteroposterior stability of the knee joint. They are named according to the attachment on the tibia. Now, the anterior cruciate ligament begins from the anterior part of the intercondylar area of the tibia. It runs upwards, backwards and laterally and is attached to the posterior part of the medial surface of the lateral condyle of the femur and it is taught during the extension of the knee. The posterior cruciate ligament begins from the posterior part of the intercondylar area of the tibia. It runs upwards, forwards and medially and is attached to the anterior part of the lateral surface of the medial condyle of the femur. It is tight during the flexion of the knee. Both the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament are supplied by the medial genicular vessels and nerves. Now, concising the important point under the cruciate ligaments, we have that the cruciate ligaments are very thick and strong fibrous bands. They act as direct bonds of union between the tibia and the femur to maintain the anteroposterior stability of the knee joint. They are named according to the attachment on the tibia. The anterior cruciate ligament begins from the anterior part of the intercondylar area of the tibia. It runs upwards, backwards and laterally. It is attached to the posterior part of the medial surface of the lateral condyle of the femur. It is tight during the extension of the knee. Now moving on to the posterior cruciate ligament. It begins from the posterior part of the intercondylar area of the tibia. It runs upwards forwards and medially. It is attached to the anterior part of the lateral surface of the medial condyle of the femur and it is tight during the flexion of the knee. These are supplied by the middle genicular vessels and the nerves. Next, let's move on to the menisci or the semilunar cartilages. The menisci are two fibrocartilaginous discs. They are shaped like crescents. They deepen the articular surfaces of the tibia and partially divide the joint cavity into the upper and lower compartments. Flexion and extension of the knee takes place in the upper compartment whereas the rotation takes place in the lower compartment. Now let's look at the features of each of the following meniscus. There are two ends, the anterior and the posterior ends. The anterior and posterior ends of the menisci are attached to the tibia and are referred to as anterior and posterior horns. This is the anterior horn and this is the posterior horn of the meniscus. There are two borders. The outer border is thick as you can see here and the inner border is thin. The outer border is thick, convex and close to the fibrous capsule whereas the inner border is thin, concave and free. Now there are two surfaces. The upper surface is concave for articulation with the femur. The lower surface that lies beneath this is flat and it rests on the tibial condyle. The peripheral thick part is vascular whereas the inner part is avascular and is nourished by the synovial fluid. The medial meniscus as you see right here is nearly semicircular being wider behind than in front. The lateral meniscus is nearly circular. Looking at the functions of the menisci, they help in making the articular surfaces more congruent. The menisci serve as shock absorbers. They help in lubricating the joint cavity. Because of their nerve supply, they also have a sensory function. Now looking at the important points under the menisci or the semilunar cartilages, the menisci are two fibrocartilaginous discs. They are shaped like crescents. 
they deepen the articular surfaces of the condyles of the tibia and partially divide the joint cavity into the upper and lower compartments. Flexion and extension of the knee take place in the upper compartment whereas rotation takes place in the lower compartment. Each meniscus has the following features. Two ends that is the anterior and posterior ends of the menisci are attached to the tibia and referred to as anterior and posterior horns. There are two borders. The outer border is thick, convex and close to the fibrous capsule whereas the inner border is thin, concave and free. There are two surfaces. The upper surface is concave for articulation with the femur while the lower surface is flat and rests on the tibial condyle. The peripheral thick part is vascular whereas the inner part is avascular and is nourished by the synovial fluid. The medial meniscus is nearly semicircular being wider behind than in front. The lateral meniscus is nearly circular. The posterior end of the meniscus is attached to the medial condyle of the femur through two meniscofemoral ligaments. Looking at the functions of the menisci, they help in making the articular surfaces more congregant. The menisci serve as shock absorbers, they help in lubricating the joint cavity and finally because of their nerve supply, they also have a sensory function. Finally, we have the transverse ligament of the knee joint. It connects the anterior ends of the medial and the lateral menisci right here. The transverse ligament connects the anterior ends of the medial and lateral meniscus. Now let's move on to the synovial membrane of the knee joint. The area highlighted in red is the synovial membrane. Now the synovial membrane of the knee joint lines the capsule except posteriorly where it is reflected forwards by the cruciate ligaments. In front it is absent from the patella. Above the patella it is prolonged upwards for 5 cm or more as the supra patella bursa right here. Below the patella, it covers the deep surface of the infra patella pad of fat which separates it from the ligamentum patellae as you can see right here. A median fold, the infra patellar synovial fold extends backwards from the pad of fat to the intercondylar fossa of the femur. The alar fold diverges on each side from the medial fold to reach the lateral edges of the patella. Concising the main points under the synovial membrane, the synovial membrane of the knee joint lines the capsule except posteriorly where it is reflected forwards by the cruciate ligaments. In front it is absent from the patella. Above the patella it is prolonged upwards for 5 cm or more as the supra patella bursa. Below the patella, it covers the deep surface of the infrapatellar pad of fat which separates it from the ligamentum patellae. A median fold called the infrapatellar synovial fold extends backwards from the pad of fat to the intercondylar area of the femur. An ala fold diverges on each side from the median fold to reach the lateral edges of the patella. Now let's look at the bursae around the knee joint. 12 bursae have been described around the knee that is 4 anterior, 4 lateral and 4 medial. Let's look at the anterior bursae. First is the subcutaneous prepetilla bursa that you can see right here. Second is the subcutaneous infrapetilla bursa right here. Then there is the deep infrapetilla bursa and finally there is the suprapetilla bursa. These four are the anterior bursae. The four lateral bursa are a bursa deep to the lateral head of the gastrocnemius, a bursa between the fibular collateral ligament and the biceps femoris muscle. Third is a bursa between the fibular collateral ligament and the tendon of popliteus and fourth is a bursa between the tendon of the popliteus and the lateral condyle of the tibia. And finally, let's look at the four medial bursae. First is a bursa deep to the medial head of the gastrocnemius. Second is the anserine bursa that separates the tendons of the sartorius, gracilis and semitendinosus from one another from the tibia and from the tibial collateral ligament. Third is a bursa deep to the tibial collateral ligament and fourth is a de bursa deep to the semimembranosus muscle. Now concising the main points under the bursa around the knee joint, 12 bursae have been described around the knee. 
four anterior, four lateral and four medial. These bursae are as follows. The anterior bursae include the subcutaneous prepetala bursa, the subcutaneous infrapetala bursa, deep infrapetala bursa and the suprapetala bursa. The lateral bursae include a bursa deep to the lateral head of the gastrocnemius, a bursa between the fibula collateral ligament and biceps femoris, a bursa between the fibula collateral ligament and the tendon of popliteus, and a bursa between the tendon of the popliteus and the lateral condyle of the tibia. Finally, the medial four bursae include a bursa deep to the medial head of the gastrocnemius, the anserine bursa which separates the tendons of the sartorius, gracilis and semitendinosus from one another from the tibia and from tibial collateral ligament, a bursa deep to the tibial collateral ligament and finally a bursa deep to the semimembranosus muscle. Now let's look at the relations of the knee joint. Anteriorly, the knee joint is related to the anterior bursa, the ligamentum petale as you can see right here and the petalar plexus of nerves. Posteriorly, at the middle, it is related to the popliteal vessels and the tibial nerve as you can see right here. Posterolaterally, it is related to the lateral head of the gastrocnemius right here, the plantaris and the common peroneal nerve, these three structures, posterolaterally. Now, posteromedially, it is related to the medial head of the gastrocnemius right here, the semitendinosus, semimembranosus, the gracilis and the popliteus muscle at its insertion. Medially, the knee joint is related to the sartorius muscle, gracilis, semitendinosus and semimembranosus as you can see right here and the great saphenous vein with its saphenous nerve. Laterally, the knee joint is related to the biceps femoris muscle and the tendon of origin of the popliteus. Concising the relations of the knee joint, anteriorly it is related to the anterior bursae, the ligamentum petalae and the petalar plexus of nerves. Posteriorly, at the middle, it is related to the popliteal vessels, the tibial nerve. Posterolaterally, it is related to the lateral head of the gastrocnemius, plantaris and the common peroneal nerve. Posteromedially, it is related to the medial head of the gastrocnemius, semitendinosus, semimembranosus, gracilis and popliteus as it at its insertion. Medially, it is related to the gracilis, sartorius, semitendinosus, the great saphenous vein with its saphenous nerve, and the semimembranosus muscle. Laterally, the knee joint is related to the biceps femoris and the tendon of origin of the popliteus muscle. Now looking at the blood supply of the knee joint, it is supplied by the five genicular branches of the popliteal artery, the descending genicular branch of the femoral artery, the descending branch of the lateral circumflex femoral artery, the two recurrent branches of the anterior tibial artery and the circumflex femoral branch of posterior tibial artery. So we have the popliteal artery, femoral artery, lateral circumflex femoral artery, anterior tibial artery and the posterior tibial artery. The nerve supply of the knee joint is by the femoral, sciatic and the obturator nerve. Now let us look at the movements at the knee joint. The active movements at the knee joint are flexion, extension, medial rotation and lateral rotation of the knee joint. Flexion and extension are the primary movements at the knee joint. They occur in the upper compartment of the knee above the menisci. Medial rotation occurs during the last 30 degrees of extension movement, whereas lateral rotation occurs during the initial stages of flexion. Rotatory movements occur around a vertical axis in the lower compartment of the knee joint below the menisci. Concising the points under the movements at the knee joint, active movements at the knee joint are flexion, extension, medial and lateral rotation. Flexion and extension are the chief movements. These take place in the upper compartment of the joint above the menisci. Medial rotation of the femur occurs during the last 30 degrees of extension, while lateral rotation of the femur occurs during the initial stages of flexion. Rotatory movements take place around a vertical axis in the lower compartment of the joint below the menisci. During different phases of movements of the knee, different portions of the petula articulate with the femur. The lower pair of articular facets articulates during extension, the middle pair during the beginning of flexion, the upper pair during mid-flexion 
and the medial strip during the full flexion of the knee. Now let us look at the mechanism of locking and unlocking of the knee joint. Now locking is a mechanism that permits the knee joint to remain in full extension as in standing without much muscular effort. It is brought about by the medial rotation of the femur during the last stages of extension of the knee joint. This is the right femur. The anteroposterior diameter of the lateral femoral condyle is less than that of the medial condyle. As a result, when the lateral condylar articular surface right here is fully used up by extension, part of the medial condylar surface remains unused. At this stage, the lateral condyle serves as an axis around which the medial condyle rotates backwards, that is, medial rotation of the femur occurs, so that the remaining part of the medial condylar surface is also taken up. This movement locks the knee joint. Locking is aided by the oblique pull of the ligaments during the last stages of extension. The locked knee can be flexed only after the reversal of medial rotation that is lateral rotation of the femur. The unlocking is brought about by the popliteus muscle. Looking at the points under the locking and unlocking of the knee joint, Locking is a mechanism that allows the knee to remain in the position of full extension as in standing without much muscular effort. Locking occurs as a result of medial rotation of the femur during the last stage of extension. The anteroposterior diameter of the lateral femoral condyle is less than that of the medial condyle. As a result, when the lateral condylar articular surface is fully used up by extension, Part of the medial condylar surface remains unused. At this stage, the lateral condyle serves as an axis around which the medial condyle rotates backwards, that is, medial rotation of the femur occurs, so that the remaining part of the medial condylar surface is also taken up. This movement locks the knee joint. Locking is aided by the oblique pull of the ligaments during the last stages of extension. Now, the locked knee joint can be fully flexed only after it is unlocked by a reversal of medial rotation that is by lateral rotation of the femur. Unlocking is brought about by the action of the popliteus muscle. Muscles producing movements at the knee joint. Extension movement is produced by the quadriceps. Locking is produced by the vastus medialis muscle. Unlocking is produced by the popliteus muscle. Flexion is brought about by the biceps femoris and the semi-tendinosus and semi-membranosus. The medial rotation of the flexed leg is brought about by popliteus, semi-membranosus, semi-tendinosus and lateral rotation of the flexed leg is brought about by biceps femoris muscle. These muscles right here constitute the quadriceps femoris muscles. This muscle you see here is the popliteus muscle. This is the biceps femoris muscle. This is the semi-tendinosus and this is the semi-membranosus muscle. Looking at the clinical anatomy of the knee joint, osteoarthritis is an age-related cartilage degeneration of the articular surface. Deformities of the knee include genu valgum, genu varum. Diseases of the knee include infections. Injuries include injuries to the menisci, to the cruciate ligaments and collateral ligaments. Malalignment of the patella, Baker's cyst, and semi-membranosus bursitis. I hope you found this video helpful. To get updates on my latest videos, click on the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.